Hey, yo, dog. What's cracking? You're listening to another episode of Battles with Bits of Rubber. I mean, is is there seriously a need for this podcast? Uh, like, isn't there, is, isn't all that stuff done nowadays with computers and, and CGI or whatever it is? Ah, oh, jeez. <laughs> Oh my gosh. So, after Christmas, I I'm drinking very sensibly. I'm drinking water uh with a squeeze of lemon in it, which is why it kind of looks like an alcoholic's piss sample. It's not good. <laughs> that's that's such a such a an an, an aristocratic beverage. It is, yes. See here that I got some ice water. Oh man, I am juice. so glad to be home. It's we and we made it home just in time. It has been snowing all fucking day. Did you get was there a chance that you might have caught like closures of airports and stuff oh yeah oh yeah. shit but we lucked out we got home and it was just starting flurry last week we got in late mm-hmm. uh, uh, a bumpy ride and a really rough landing i oh, mean really? we came down like we hit the runway like a fucking boulder wow it was, why, why so it just was, boom just a lot of wind or? I, uh no i i th- maybe they were sleeping i'm not sure or because the <laughs> It's just like, oh, sh- there, there's a runway. Wham! <laughs> the landing woke up the pilot. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no. Oh, my gosh. Hey, but, you know, anyone you can walk away from is a, is a good one. That's true. Well, I've got um, a print on the go. You, you may be able to hear that in the background. My, what are you uh, making? My printer. Oh, well, I'm printing uh, a core. I'm trying something out. Uh, I just want to try <laughs> printing a core. I'm not convinced the material I'm printing with, which is just basically like a wood filament. F, you know, mm-hmm. it's a... PLA. PLA. What am I like? Yeah. Palestinian Liberation Front. Army. <laughs> um, yes. It's uh, it's just, it's PLA, but it's got wood in it. It's wood filament. I really like that because it sands nicely. Um, yeah. And it gives a nice finish. But uh, yeah, I'm not convinced it will be strong enough to do anything decent with. So I'm just, I've got like this sort of sculpted section of face and I'm printing a, a core. And then my plan is to basically then remold that and then, um, uh, you know, make a resin version and try it out and just see. Is it just a generic face or just is it a generic? Specific? No, no, it's a, just a, a very uh, deliberately and a generic androgynous sculpted face. So it's it's symmetrical and without poor texture and all that kind of stuff. So do you do it in ZBrush? Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Well, actually, I had uh, it's, it's, it's a model. I had a, a mate of mine, Martin Rizard, sculpt probably about two years ago. Um, cause I had some projects, some ideas with it and I never got around to doing anything with it. This last couple of years it got me busy and uh, I suddenly thought, Ooh, Christmas is a little bit quieter. Um, so we'll, uh, we'll, we'll get that done. So, um, so I'm experimenting. So I'm quite pleased. Nice. But one of the curious things I, I had to try and figure out was, was scaling things to be the correct size, which is, you know, obviously if it's sculpted in ZBrush, it can be any size. Um, yeah, that's the one, th- one, one of the few complaints i have about Z- about zbrush you know the, the user interface is something entirely another another rant yeah but um yeah there's no there's no scale so you can scan scan a like i would do in the photogrammetry scan something bring it into zbrush mm-hmm. and then you've got to figure out how to get it you know scaled accurately for the size of the the person you were you were scanning, mm. and I, I, I find that somewhat strange that there's not a way to get something scanned in the way it's supposed to be, so you don't have to fuck around with scaling it. And then, well, it looks looks like the person I just did the scan of, but mm. the, it's. I think their head's bigger than an inch and a half. Yeah, that's a curious thing with it because I think the whole sculpt, sculpting thing and the whole ZBrush thing, it, it, it's it's good in that you can make things with it, but it has a, it's a curiously specific demand to make something that has got to fit a person, so it has to be the right, right. size, and it's something like with Fusion Three Hundred and Sixty. Obviously, it's it's a completely different way of making things, and it's it's clunky by comparison, but it. Everything is exact and measured. You, you start from drawings, right. don't you, to the millimeter, so you can make it exactly right. how big you want it to be. And it's a faithful reprint. When I printed things, I've 
you know, drawn up on Fusion. It is exact. I checked it with the vernier calipers. It, it's spot oh, on. Oh yeah, yeah, no, it's it's really precise. Yeah. I, I love that about it. So anybody from Pixel Logic out there listening to this, please help us. Tell us what we're what we need to do to to be able to have scale accuracy for prosthetic work. Well, yeah, I mean, the, it can't be the only thing that needs that kind of accuracy. And it might be, because I know they do the whole Z-Modeler, which I haven't really dipped into, but I'm sure it's the same thing. But when you, I don't know, I really like being able to do things precisely, you know. Yeah. If you, you know. Well, for what we do, it, it, it pretty, if you're trying to get something to fit someone specifically, mm. we, ne- we need that kind of accuracy. Yeah. Well, it's just an engineering you don't thing. It's, a, it's an engineering requirement on something that has previously existed in the wobbly world of clay pushers. Do you know what I mean? So it's a, it's a, it's, <laughs> yeah. it's a curious hybrid requirement, which I guess doesn't matter to ZBrush in the same way that clay stuff never mattered to engineering. So it's somewhere between the hybrid problem. Um, but yeah, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try that out. And print that off, and that'll be fine. I think it'll be finished in a couple of hours, but I'll probably be in bed by then because it's later here. Um, but uh, yeah, I'll see how it goes in the morning. Yeah, uh, I've I've been a slug all day. I've been I've been trying to optimize do do some some search engine optimization on my website, and I keep making the changes that it's telling me to make exactly mm-hmm. the way I do it. I save it, I, I, I do it, and I go and check the refreshed. Uh, get it checked up so all the stuff will go onto Google properly and it's telling me I didn't do it. I said, oh. I just fucking did it. Is there like it. a lag in, in the in the spiders being able to check it over or something? I don't know. It's you know it's it's all within the, mm-hmm. the software that I built the website on. Uh, Wix, okay. if anyone's curious. And it's been it's been great, but I'm I'm doing doing exactly what it's telling me to do, following the examples and using all of the, mm-hmm. the right keywords. I'm doing everything. And I'll refresh it, and it's still saying it sounds nope, like a refresh it. thing. It's not right. Yeah, it's well, it's it's messed up. And then I'll you know because I'm going down this checklist of stuff, and they're all you know getting the green check on stuff, and I'll go to the next one and, and do something and set that up correctly, and it'll come back saying nope, you didn't do that. And one of the previously green checked items will suddenly mm-hmm. be nope, this is wrong too again, That's and I hadn't done a fucking thing to it yeah it's 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 pissing me off so <laughs> i'm drinking now it's a good option i look at you past the worst of it well i'm, I'm still sipping my water normally yeah. when i call it's me with a with a with a glass of wine or something but on this occasion because it, because there has been a certain amount of excess over christmas although i've been pretty good actually i didn't eat anything on boxing day the day after christmas i i yeah. abstained from food because i'd eaten why plenty not? and i thought Do you know what i wonder if i can just go for a day without eating my stupid fat face so i um i didn't i didn't eat anything and it was fine actually and I, f- I slept really well that night and i felt great the next day so it may be something i do once in a while just to kind of um yeah. offset it just gives your guts a chance to you know but i've got uh yeah so my my prints uh uh print- i can you hear my printer you probably hear it on this microphone but maybe not on the one that um we're speaking through because yeah well i'm so used to hearing it from behind yeah. me, because that's where I'm. That's where my printer's set up. No, it's good. I, I I love the little thing, but I'm looking at over at my. Um, I, I just measured my AnyCubic Photon uh, available bed space, and I could probably print this easily in that. So I might try running another version in that tomorrow night. Um, so we'll give that a go, and I'll I'll compare and show the the differences. Um, I was going to talk to you today cool. about, and I don't know how how different this is over in the states, but we've touched on it briefly before. But I'm curious about. Um, I want to try uh, some basically safer materials. I'm thinking in places like colleges and stuff, which, you know, a lot of colleges will be keen to sort of use as much professional material as they can because obviously they're trying to prepare people for working in workshops, whatever. But it will be good Mm -hmm. to also uh, talk about and and do some videos on using materials which are, you know, not fumey and not dangerous and not toxic. Um, Instead, and I know over there, it may be less imperative over there, I don't know, because your plasters are so good. Although I've been hearing that UltraCal 30 is not quite what it was nowadays. Is, is that true? I, I yeah, I, I, it's still, still pretty, pretty good, but I've noticed that it, it doesn't seem to mix up the same way I remember it mixing when I first started right. using it. 
many okay. many years I'm ago. Curious to know if that was just a bad batch or if it's just where it, where it's coming from. Or no, it's it seems to it seems to be pretty consistent through the last several bags I've I wonder I've if that's... Do you, where is it? Uh, is it made any one place or is it made all over the place? I'm wondering if there's like the state that it's in is restricted to chemical and maybe that's why they've changed the formula or something or... That I'm not sure. I'm... I, I've... You know, I, it's, I think it's something I used to know but I don't recall it off the top mm. of my head right now. Because I noticed um, whenever I used to watch, you know, uh, and read stuff in magazines, pretty much all the molds were done in plaster. And it was stuff from like the Caglioni and Drexler effects lab in Gorzone, which was a fucking godsend. It was amazing. I used to love reading through those. And uh, they'd always have like pictures of molds and all the molds in it were, were ultra cow. And in the um, the three dimensional Lee Bagan book, you know, three dimensional makeup, all that, they're in an right. ultra cow. And ultra cow is not something we have over here, really. I, I've not seen it in England. I'm sure it can be imported, but it's not something you're going to find um, typically. I'm surprised there's not something pretty close because I mean it's 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 a natural naturally occurring mineral. It's mine. Yeah, this, yeah. just the same way. Absolutely. I mean, is. you've got your gypsum deposits, but I think just because the landmass that is the USA is so big, you're going to have you know just because of the 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 space it occupies, you're going to find within with, within that landmass, you're going to find much better. I mean, they do in France. Because the whole plaster of Paris, I think there, there are there are parts of the world. Right. But it's just it's. I mean, I think one of the best we have is probably Cristocal R, but it's still not as hard as Alpha K. Uh, um, sorry, it's mm-hmm. still not as hard as Ultra Cal Thirty. We do have one called Alpha K, which is pretty hard too. That's probably the hardest plaster I've used here, um, and it's. But it's not. It it kind of slumps. It's not. You can't build with it. It kind of when you agitate it, it just flows back down. So it's fine for flood molds, for little block block molds, but it's mm-hmm. not great for things that you've got to build up a surface. So, you know, if you're trying to make a full head or something, it, you can't really use that. So right. that's why I think over here we have a lot more resin stuff. Partly that, and partly because of the whole marine industry. Because being an island, I just think there was an imperative to build a lot of boats and stuff. So I think we have a very very good polyester resin and epoxy resin sort of set up here so that's why we tend to do a lot more epoxy and fiberglass stuff but i'm just trying to think of things that we could look at that would be not as smelly or as toxic partly because i think as time goes by it's going to be harder and harder to justify making things out of materials that never break down or or are lethal (laughs) um yeah, and, <laughs> right, and also right. just in terms of like in terms of training and colleges and stuff, where perhaps they don't have as thorough an extraction unit, or they set up a unit in a building that you know the guys doing catering next door can smell it, and it's like, well, <laughs> you know, so mm. it'd be good to look at some materials like that that are less toxic. Um, over here we have uh, there's one called jesmonite, which is a kind of acrylic compound. It's like an acrylic liquid, and you add. Uh, a gypsum powder to it and you whip it up with a mixer you know on a on a drill mm-hmm. uh, i think it's three parts or two and a half parts jesmonite to one part liquid sorry well the powder is the jesmonite right. the, uh, the liquid is jesmonite and the powder is it's called jesmonite but i think it's just a, a high-end gypsum um and i think you can just use regular plaster with that and you still get an improved uh, mix so there's a little bit of moisture in it but not as much as if you just use water and yeah. that's quite nice that's quite good again for block molds and i have done uh jackets with it it's not as strong as fiberglass though that's the trouble are you familiar with uh Forton mg have you heard that no do, do you guys that have Forton good. over there um it's essentially it's, it's a it's a gypsum uh almost like ultra cal but more more like a like a hydra hydra cal how do you spell uh, that but uh, F O R Forton F O R T O N M G yeah. uh, Hiram Ball developed it uh, some years ago, and Smoothon bought the bought the rights to it uh, a few years back. Okay, but it's 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 essentially it's mixing a gypsum uh, with an acrylic instead of water. That, that sounds a lot like um, the same. Process, yeah, basically. that's 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 what that's what brought it to mind. Oh, um, okay. So so it's it's wicked strong, and and it's, it's a little lighter than than if you were doing something strictly out of 
out of UltraCal because you don't have to have the, th the same thickness to get the, an, an, an equal strength, if that makes yeah. sense. Yeah. Um, but it, it requires some precision in measuring out the components to put it all, put it all together. Um, but uh, one of my mentors, Dave Parvin, who passed away a few years ago, mm -hmm. um, swore by Forton, and that's what he used to cast all of his his um, life casting positives out of. You know, he he was doing life casting for art instead of for prosthetic work. Yeah, and he Forton was really the only thing for for finished pieces. It's what he used. It's virtually indestructible once it's once it's oh. done. Okay. So I that, might have to that, try and that, get some. Yeah, that's that's something that we might want to want to look at as as far as doing as an alternative to mm. to some of the gypsums that that we've been been using, and I may may even do some tests to see how that stands up using different gypsums with the same with the uh, same other ingredients for Forton, just not using the their main stone. I, I, I'm, I'm having a senior moment with the the name of the gypsum that they use as their their okay. gypsum component for it. I'll look it up and I'll get in touch uh, with our smooth on guys over here and see if they know anything about it. Yeah, I, I'm sure. I'm sure Bentley would would. What um, I'd like to do is uh, I might do a straight up you know Pepsi challenge with it and get uh, get some Forton if I can, and then Jasmineite. The other one that I've got a sample of and i've used it a couple of years ago but i need to get some more in is one called acrylic one and it comes from somewhere i think it's sweden or no it's it's somewhere somewhere in the sort of scandinavian neck of the woods and i know they've been using it over there a fair bit some of the effects guys have been using it and i think it's pretty good but it'd be nice to try that and i think that there's also uh, there's an acrylic compound that taranti do as well so i need to look that up too let me just write that down this is the Taranti one. I can't remember what it's called. It's like an acrylic uh, compound for plaster. <laughs> there's the Taranti. There's acrylic one. <laughs> there's jesmonite. And then there's the four-time one. So there's four there that we, we, in theory, could try out. And it'd be quite nice to try them in block molds, try them with silicone, maybe run foam in yeah. them and see. Although I did, I remember running, we ran jesmonite pieces uh p foam pieces in jesmonite christ 15 20 years ago at neil's we did, did it, it work did. it just kind of crumbled yeah. under the sort of pressure of the bolts so maybe if we'd made them as block molds instead that might have been fine and it's slightly porous i think the pieces came out drier but they just weren't very good at the bolting again it's that compression force and i would imagine the same if you've got like you know two right. thin walls uh, you know, of, of flange flange walls of a mold. You you know, you can get them three or four millimeters thick in fiberglass, and they are not going to break. You know, <laughs> they'll flex, but they won't break. Whereas with this stuff, it's right. it's rigid. It's not flexible, so it doesn't give you that little flex to be able mm -hmm. to sort of you know wedge a screwdriver in and then pop it from you know further in. Yeah, and it, and it, it probably, would probably would, cracks. So you'd have to adjust crack. your mold strategy accordingly. Um, and I did make a a jacket. I videoed it, I think. I videoed some of it. I'm going to have to check my video. Um, but uh, I made this jacket. I think it was the jacket for the life cast that Kenny Myers did for the li he did the life cast for the makeup we did in LA for IMAX 2017. And they know the Lugosi makeup. Um, oh yeah. And uh, yeah, I believe he did the life cast of the guy. Uh, and sent me the plaster head and I master molded it and I think I tried some jesmonite instead and you know what was interesting is because it didn't smell uh, it was kind of quicker to work with in, in as much as you didn't have to get a load of gear on to protect yourself and you could wash the brushes in water but it right. meant it also set quite quickly so I was doing I think I did it in three pieces but because it kind of set and it was then ready to do the next side, there was no break. <laughs> so I did it in a day and I was exhausted. And I remember thinking, bloody hell. 
Well, it's yeah, nice four that it's quick, pretty but easy it, too. It, it meant what I found with Curious is because I'm so used to having like the downtime of like doing one side of fiberglass and then leave it for a few hours and then do the other one. You get like a break in between. With this, you didn't get a break. So mm-hmm. I did the whole thing in a day, which was great, but it was exhausting. But it meant, holy shit, you can do this really quickly. <laughs> but I was feeling the negative side of it, which was I had no break because I was used to doing other things in between. Because I just assumed, oh, I've done one side, I'll leave it till tomorrow right. in fiberglass. But with this, you can do it an hour later. <laughs> so it's like, oh shit. So, so in a way, it kind of makes you work a little bit quicker. It changes your workflow. So I think that's an example of some of the things you might have to change. And like I said, it's not going to be good for everything, but it certainly is worth the shot. And I'm wondering if you couldn't use it in the same way as you did your epoxy coat molds, where you do, you know, an epoxy gel coat and then back it up with this. So it's still thin, you know, it's still thin. I don't see why it not. has the strength. And then yeah. maybe back it up with just, you know, a cheaper plaster. So you've got the, the surface is epoxy. It's backed up with maybe, a, you know, a quarter inch of laminated jesmonite or photon whatever um and then you know back it up with something solid uh plaster which is not expensive but it's just something to stop it from flexing but the structural strength is in the jesmonite and the surface release qualities come from the epoxy so it kind of uses the best of everything but at a cheaper price okay, again trying to look at it from a student point of view where you don't want to spend a huge amount of money but you want semi-decent results as, and, and as sure. soon as you get something bigger than a nose tip then it starts getting into things you know warping and stuff so it would be interesting to not do that you know the photon stuff does it come with like um a fiber or a quad axial because this is what we have for the jesmonite it's like quad axial fiberglass which mm-hmm. you sort of cut to shape uh doesn't doesn't come with it but you can certainly mix uh chopped glass or or um yeah you know, I guess urethane you could. Fibers i'm curious about it. the glass though because the thing i'm I'm not convinced about the quad axial stuff. Is it is glass okay? And if you're using what is essentially a water based or an acrylic y paste, it's not going to soak into and break down and merge with the glass in the way that polyester resin does. So, correct, yeah, that's that's always been my concern when I use chopped glass um, with epoxy or in mm. in uh, UltraCal thirty. It's it's gonna it's going to add add some additional some strength yeah. that wouldn't be there otherwise, but because it doesn't become one with mm-hmm. the material you're mixing it with, it's it's not going to yeah, have it's a that curious ultimate. One. And I bond. guess the only way you'd know is to sort of do some strips, uh, you know, material, and then sort of stress stress them, see you know, see what weight it breaks at, you know, and do some with with hemp maybe, and some with burlap and some with with nothing Mm -hmm. and some with the glass and see if that makes a difference because that would be an interesting one to do but it's just the kind of thing though those materials would be useful i think uh to use partly uh, for whenever you're doing block molds but it's just you know it's not going to replace everything but it might replace a chunk and it certainly helps you out budgetary wise and certainly helps you out with regards to getting stuff done where that you otherwise may have not sufficient extraction or you know you're working in an institution which you know is up five floors <laughs> so you can't go outside and do it you can't just whip your mold outside um, <laughs> and if you're working in in one of those institutions where they don't have specific storage cubbies for each student to put their mm. the materials in and leave them till the next class period where if if they've got to schlep everything out of the classroom when the when class is over take it with them and then bring it back you don't want students to have mm. to be carrying something that's, you know, 25% of their, their own body weight to the next class they have to go to and then get on a bus to go across town to get get home at the end of the day and then do the same thing again the following class period. It's like... It's crazy, isn't it? Yeah, gotta, it's, there's gotta it's, be it's a curious way. to me that yeah. that's the case because I remember when I was at college... You know, it was it was five days a week and it was full time, and your space was your space, uh, and it's like I don't right. know. If it's just because. And you would think at an art school that would be yeah. one of the paramount considerations. You you don't want to have to have your students carrying their paints and their sculpting tools and all of the stuff for the different mm-hmm. art classes that they're taking no, with them the everywhere they go. They should. If I'm if I'm sculpting I'm sculpting in room five eighty 
589, you know, that's where I'm going to leave my stuff until I have to sculpt again. And that's just, it'll always be there. My painting stuff is going to be in the paint lab. My sculpting stuff's going to be in the, mm. in the, in the sculpting studio. My, it's, it's all where it's supposed to be, well, not it- in my backpack. <laughs> giving me scoliosis well, it was always a curious thing for me because i was so used to my you know my experience at college then when i started teaching at colleges years later it was all different like no one was smoking for one thing uh, there were like you know swipe entry cards to get into every building and every room which again we didn't have that this is way back when mm-hmm. but also you know i had a dedicated space there, there, there was no hot desking there was no you know, this room is being used by a different group later on. It was just, this is your area. Right. You went to different classes for lectures or life drawing or whatever, but you had your base where you worked, and that was where all your stuff went. And you had a desk and, you know, space to put your shit, and that was your your dedicated space. But it feels like, because they want to have, a, you know, more students in a class, it's it's cheaper to have, like, people come in two days a week, you know, and they do a lot of self-directed learning elsewhere at other times of the week that you could use that same space for two or three different groups, which means no one can just leave their shit there. So it limits the scale of the things that you can do and the practicality of saying, oh, I'll fiberglass it, right. I'll trim it in the morning. No, you have to move that stuff out. Do you know what I mean? That kind of stuff. It's like, oh, that's crazy. Um, it's, it's, it's a curious yeah. thing. That, and it's going to limit what you can do with your space. So, yeah, having something self-contained and smaller that you might pour it up it just about sets you can put it in your locker and it's not going to hum the whole corridor out until you get to it the following week because you know it's plaster instead of <laughs> right where's where's that <laughs> smell coming guy from locker six um so that's it's, it's an interesting one though and it, yeah it was it was a funny thing i i I wasn't expecting that to be the case. I was like, I just assumed you'd have a dedicated space. And a lot of colleges do, but a, a lot don't. And like I say, that's going to limit the scale of things yeah. you can do. And also no. like transferring a sculpt, like where do you put it? How do you carry it without fucking it up? You know, it's, it's normally top heavy or balanced delicately on a, a baseboard. And, you know, part of the job should be to maybe make a box that fits over the top that you can screw it together and it's safe. But then... Do you have access to a machine room to do that? Yeah, oh, I can't tell you how many times I've had. Yeah, you know, I can't tell you how many times I've had students come to class uh, with a sob story that they they took their monster clay sculpture home with them and left it in the car over the weekend. Melted. <laughs> it's yeah, the, and it melted into the oh. upholstery of the the car, or, or it 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 fell down and you know the face is flat and it's like. I, f- I feel yeah, your pain, keep believe me. But Yeah, you, you, you kind of need that yeah, kind of thing. But you need the, the base, and then you need like a, a, a box that goes around the base that, that attaches very securely with a carry handle on the top. Yeah. And you make that first before you start sculpting, <laughs> so that as and when you need to take it away. I had a student who actually built one of those. He, he was a woodworker and built a brilliant case just like that that had a drawer in the bottom for all mm-hmm. of his sculpting tools. And he just just carried this head his box head around box. with him, so he could take take the lid off. And his his sculpture his sculpture was right there. It was it had an armature, you know, head armature built into it that he could sculpt right on, and it it would swivel, and he could pull out a drawer with the tools in it. It's like, geez, I fucking, want one of those. Anyone listen? You should make one of those. That that'd fucking do bank. It that'd be fun. great for students. Was, a box brilliant. like that with a drawer on the bottom. Like you say, in a head thing and the handle, yeah. so that you can safely take your box that you head away with you. Yeah, it just had little cl- little clips clips to attach mm. the the top to Amazing. the bottom, and it had a handle on it. So you just you carry go. it around like a hat Job box. Done. Well, someone handy with woodwork should do that. Um, yeah, no, it, it's 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 a, it is an odd thing that uh, you know, obviously, the practicalities of of moving these things around is a thing um, and like I say I hadn't really thought about it until I saw other people going oh no we've got to clear out because they're you know they're doing nails in an even class in this room and I'm like really you know so that's a curious one you know what your printer sounds like what's that I just it sounds like a model train right driving around uh, around the bottom of a Christmas tree or something it sounds like a model <laughs> railroad <laughs> well yeah it does a little bit it's, it's quite interesting actually the shapes of it are quite you know obviously when it's printing repetitive uh, patterns like infill and stuff it can sound quite musical at times it's quite nice mm-hmm. depending on the shape it's got a direct it's lovely um, yeah when mine is printing curves around around curves it's it sounds like an alien singing <laughs> you should record them for that 
I, I need to. Here, here's a, a a left turn. Guess who I guess who I ran into in Atlanta and had lunch with the other day. Who's that? Brian Kinney. Oh yes. Oh yeah. You posted pictures. Yeah, that was. Uh, he hadn't been posting much on on Instagram lately, and I just happened to see a post that he had put up uh, of having having lunch with his grandmother on her ninety fifth birthday. Oh my. In it in Atlanta, I said, and so I texted him back. I said, "Are you are you in Atlanta now?" And he texted back and said, "Yeah." So so we had lunch the following day. That's awesome. And had a had a great time. I hadn't seen him since we were in in uh, L.A. for Monster Palooza for the for the tenth anniversary. Amazing. I actually have uh, an interview. I, I spoke to him because he he lives not far from. Yeah, me. he we 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 talked about that. Yeah, and I've still got it, and I just it's sat on my hard drive. I just haven't had time to get around to editing it, but I will put that out soon. Um, now that you reminded me that, especially that seems like a timely, timely reminder. Oh, that's cool. Yeah, is it fun? Nice, yeah, nice lunch. Oh, we had a great time. He's such a he's such a cool dude. Yeah, very debonair, isn't he? As well, very stylish. Yeah, yep. Yeah. Uh, living uh, most of he's mostly in London now, but um, he's you know he's still uh, doing. The, travel thing you know got he lives in new york and and london but he's he's a member of um 706 as well as 798 which is the east 798 is the east coast mm-hmm. uh iatsa union 706 is the la uh chapter and he's also he's involved he's the the craft the education arm of of 706 oh cool so we talked about a bunch of stuff and It'll be it'll be fun to revisit. Yes, man, it will be my lunch with him when when you get ready to do do that podcast. Copy that because I yeah because he he's he's doing all kinds of stuff. You know, I I bought a he he refurbishes uh, old Gerstner makeup kits. Yes, uh, as a hobby. Yes, I remember you bought one. Kind of a kind of a side hustle, and I and I bought yeah. one that he had refurbished, which is my go to. It's my main. My main kit now. It is the coolest makeup case I've ever had. Yeah, that's important it's, to be because they're, they're, they're such good cases. And um, I should put a little yeah. link on that uh, of some of the stuff he's done because I've seen pictures of them of the ones he's he's done up. Oh, I want to show you. Um, <laughs> it's a slight. I if I can show you this on my phone, if you can even see that. I can't. I I don't even have an image of you up. I I oh, can't even maybe see I you. Didn't put my camera on. How about that? Da, 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 cameras on. There you are. There we go. <laughs> Hello. Yeah, now you can show me. Hello. All right. So I don't know if you can see that. Not clearly. It's basically four. It's blue. Let me send you. It's basically four. What I've done is I just I experimented with something. I I, I was always um, getting bored of of, of molding, um, you know, things with clay making clay walls to accommodate the resin. Right. And also with fast cast resin, you often get, um, uh, you know, moisture issues because the moisture is, is kind of setting up against, you know, the resin setting up against wet clay. And even though you've sprayed it with release or whatever, there's still possibly some issues or at least it's cold. So it kind of slows it down. Um, but basically what I've done was I, I, I made some bases to sculpt on and I did this, you know, because it was fusion unnecessarily beautifully. So I made everything like <laughs> with radius corners and I made the top ones five mil and the bottom ones 20 mil <laughs> radius. Uh, did you etch your name into the bottom? Not of quite, it? but I, I, I <laughs> just because every time I discover a new thing on Fusion 360, I'm like, oh, I want to do this now. So now that's what I do. Um, so I made these bases up and I thought, wouldn't it be fun if we could make mold corners that are reusable and then basically you just cut a section of wood in between the mold corners so i basically made Ooh. i made these sort of um corner retainers that you'd put on and then basically you uh put them on the base oh, that's a brilliant idea put a ratchet strap around it tighten that up so it's really stuck together and then basically cut wood that it's exactly the right size uh that slots in They're like like fence panels and then basically you release the yeah. whole thing with, you know, release spray and then flood it with silicon or resin or whatever you're going to do it in. And then it's reusable. All of it's reusable. 
Oh, that sounds great. Do that. Maybe do those. Are you? You did some at right angles. Maybe do some at at different angles so you could get different different shapes. Mm-hmm. And because um, I use a lot of foam core. Like See now that, that I mean something like foam core. Inch foam yeah, core it makes, is is by far. And then I hot glue around. Yeah, the bottom. No, foam core is by far probably the cheaper and quicker way of doing it. <laughs> Because <laughs> you just run some hot glue across it and it works fine, um, but I was it was more as is with everything with me nowadays. It's more about learning about how to use the software and my printer rather. And I'll end up making oh, something. I, I totally know, it, get it, that. It doesn't need to be this complicated, but the fun I had making it was. Just, and then when I looked at it, well, this is one of those instances where because you can is the right answer yeah exactly right so but i've also you know i've got them there but it's it was a fun thing so i just need to make a little rebate in the thing to accommodate the thickness of the wood oh now using. yeah now i'm i'm gonna i'm gonna totally try that it's good i'll send you the pictures i'll um what what i'll do is i'll put um i'll put some a couple of pictures on the show notes in the blog post for this episode but i will um i'll send you some pictures this is something we we could even uh offer up uh the stl files for these guys uh to to avid listeners yeah that'd be a good idea if i make some right angle ones because they're probably much easier to do them as corners um that are right angles because most of the time see i made radius corners which is a bit of a fucking unnecessary flourish so if i just made them right well, you angles, don't always want to have a rectangular mold sometimes you want to do something that's oval or yeah circular yeah well i'll i'll have a go at making a couple of different versions and and seeing which you know how it works it all depends on the thickness of the of the wood you're going to use but i guess you could always pack stuff out you know with bits of tape or, or yeah. some screws or something to 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 adjust the the thickness uh, it's one of those things i'm going to have to you need to see a picture of it and then it makes complete sense using words to describe it's like trying to describe cool. over the phone how to tie a shoelace it's, it's very complicated <laughs> it's a very complicated way of explaining something that's actually very easy um so shoelaces what are those that. <laughs> Velcro straps. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, yeah no, I, I, that's a that's a brilliant idea. And again, it was just uh, thank I you. Like that. But it's just uh, it was it was p- partly because when I do stuff at, with students and stuff at college, I thought, Christ, if we made up these you know mold corners and we just cut you know fifty pieces of wood the same size, we could just have something that just slots together and there's no hot glue. You just strap it together with a ratchet strap and pour your resin and then the block mold comes out and you know you can reuse it yeah well it's not not unlike i i made made a, a silicone mold several years ago that's maybe a quarter of it's, it's to create a rectangle mm-hmm. um about a quarter of an inch deep it's maybe a foot long and a little more than than six inches wide then I'll I'll melt monster clay and pour it into this silicone mold and let it cool and then I can cut off nice strips of of monster clay at different different widths and I can use bend those around and use those as walls for for molds nice. or also um, or I, or I could use them as flashing mm-hmm. and it's a reusable material so already. Reuse, you know, you know, already at a at the, at a a uniform thickness, and it's definitely reusable. So when you're done with it, you just pop it back in the pot and melt it up and yay, do whatever with it. Yeah, that's awesome. I printed uh, a mold for silicon keys. That was fun. I made one and sent it to, right. uh, to Gary Hunt. He wanted to. Do, he saw a picture I posted. I was like, oh, you can have this one. Um, so I need to. I need to print another one off. But. Um, but yeah, they're fun. And this is the thing. People are going to start doing stuff that matters to them with printers. Do you know what I mean? This is what's going to be exciting. Is Oh, absolutely. You know, people start absolutely. A- adopting it and then just using it in their industries, doing whatever they do with it. And it starts becoming, you know, you, people just become fluent in it as a thing. Um, so that'd be fun. Right. We should probably wind this up. I've got um, uh, an interview. It was, it was the second interview that I did at IMATS in 2019 which was ages ago (laughs) it was the chat i had with uh with rick from bolton university and he's talking about uh basically how 3d 3d printing has impacted the students and talking about you know how they're incorporating the things they do and uh he says some interesting things anyway um 
that are very relevant to people who are learning makeup effects but are aware of things like printers and stuff and how it all kind of comes together. So it'll be well worth a listen. So um, I bought a 3D printer. Uh, you know, it's a, a CR10S. Uh, and part of the reason I bought a printer was because I wanted to see what it was all about. And it made me get into things like Fusion 360 because now I had a reason to make something that I could output. And I really enjoyed it. And I thought it would be good to chat to you about how you will have seen this at the college, you know, the uni you teach at. In fact, probably explain who you are, what you're, where you're from, what you're doing and why. Well, that's made it even more awkward now because I've got to do a proper intro. Yeah, um, sorry. Hi, Stu. Hello. Um, Hello, Richard. How are you? I'm, uh, I'm Rick. I am a programme leader up at a university up in the north of England, uh, sunny Manchester. It's called the University of Bolton. We do a bunch of creature character stuff. We've got a fantastic special effects makeup degree and a model making degree as well. So we do a bunch of cool stuff. You do? Um, basically spend my days chucking clay and, uh, and shouting at students. I mean, like, in the nicest possible way. Yeah. No, it was good. Well, I've been there a few times. It's a lovely space. And I think you probably saw the dewy-eyed kind of like when I was in the main workshop space. It's just, oh, it's just exquisite. We've been... You've got stuff around. There's giant things, you know, like a big Kermit that someone's made. We've been super fortunate in the last couple of years that they, they, the university have looked after us. We've got some big new spaces, great extraction. But, yeah, you, you're talking about my favorite studio, which is, you know, the older of the two. Right. And it's just full of monsters and models. And it's a super kind of uh, exciting place. I love that that's my, my, yeah. my place of work. Yeah. Oh, it's lovely. Yeah. You have a lot of... Uh, I think what I've noticed about there, above a lot of places I've been to is a very strong uh, embracing and use of, of well, I'd say new technology it's not that new but it's relatively new uh, things like printing and CSE machining and stuff and it's interesting to see how it can be used because I think the thing is machining and stuff has happened a lot in manufacturing for so long but it's not been part of our world you know the, the makeup effects world and it's interesting to see how people use it and find uses for it I think, I think that's uh, a lot to do with kind of accessibility. You know, that I think in the last few years, the accessibility, accessibility of, sort of CNC in and, and 3D printers has just become more and more available. Mm. We can get this stuff at home. We can get desktop things. Whereas, you know, five, five years ago, we bought a printer um, by a, a very kind of well-known, reputable um, uh, 3D printing company. Um, and we spent six, six K, six grand on this machine. And it was a piece of gosa. It was it was awful. Mm. We I think in three years we were running, we got four or five good prints out of it. Uh, roll forward to kind of this year, we've spent what seven eight hundred quid on four uh, little desktop printers, and they are constantly chirping away in the background, churning out stuff, and we're getting decent prints out of them nine times out of ten. So wow. the the accessibility of it is brilliant, and what it's doing it's it's allowing uh, creative creatives and not just engineers to get hold of this cool new uh, process and go how, the, how can I break this how the fuck am I going to get something cool out of this mm-hmm. um, and I think previously it was it was engineers driving these machines so people like you and someone like you and I go with an idea and go this is what I want to do and they go nah mate can't be done whereas now we have these things ourselves and we go I bet it fucking can I, yeah. bet, I bet I can do that. And this. it doesn't and need it, to be yeah. stainless steel. It just needs yeah. to be you know, hard enough to be moulded or something. You know, and, it and, and I think that, that's kind of the super exciting thing about kind of where we are. You know, we do you know, laser cutting, 3D printing, uh, CNCs are all available as home desktop machines. We're not spending stupid money um, on, on getting access to this sort of stuff. So, what it, again, it, it reflects one of the things I love about this industry. You know, nothing really is made for us yeah. in the makeup field. It, you, you kind of you look at something and you go, I can break that and make it into something cool, you know. And you, you kind of you take these materials or processes and twist them to your own ends. And I, I think, you know, everyone I speak to at the minute is now investing in three D printing and getting something into their shops and getting people to drive them. And it, it, I think the next couple of years are going to see some really interesting things, kind of moving forward with how you know how people approach every bit of our process. Yeah. Um, one of the things that we've, you know, I've, I've been running the course there for about five years. Um, and one of the things that we talked about when I took over was the fact that, you know, the, the, the digital side of things, are, you know, we run a visual effects degree as well that's, that's kind of, you know, super popular and great. You know, we've got guys working in DNEG and these amazing companies. But we wanted to keep that skill set a little bit and kind of bleed it into the practical effects. Mm-hmm. So it's it almost like kind of you're thinking about future proof, proofing everything. And it's been so fortunate that the industry has moved that way. Next couple of years, hopefully, we're going to see some super cool stuff coming out. Yeah, I making, think making, that's the thing. making matrix molds. I mean, yeah, yeah. I, I did a little sculpt in the shop for a project, 
um, this tiny little creature sculpt. And before I'd even finished sculpting, um, Jack, my uh, my tech guy, my pet engineer, had come over, photogrammetry it, and then later that day, she was like, hey, this is your mold casing. He just kind of away, sculpted the mold casing. Uh, we hadn't printed it at that point, but sculpted the mold casing so we could just drop some rubber in, and you've got a matrix mold. It's super cool. Yeah, it speeds up the process and everything. And it's interesting because that, that, the use of that technology, once it becomes familiar to people, then that becomes like the baseline and then like the new generation come in with that as the standard and then it's like what are they going to do with it because it'll be better than what I will do with it <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah I'll try and replicate what I've already what, done what, you what know, what know and yeah they're going to start thinking outside the box with these things and yeah. it's it, genuinely exciting tech from a, it, as the technology gets better as well mm. you know we now have it completely accessible it's super cheap like my my, my colleague Jack I, you know when we bought our Ender threes, he went and bought one for himself you know, so he, you know, we have these. So he's just got one at home, and he's just constantly just running little prints, t- trying out little things, breaking and again, breaking it until you know we yeah. get something cool. Yeah. Um, and it, it it's really kind of exciting to see our students coming through and seeing what they can get away with. Because, yeah. like you said, we're we're kind of stuck in our ways. We're like, oh, I can make a snap mold with this, or I can do you know uh, the core the shelf for a matrix. And it's then when they come through and we're talking about the principles of mold making, and they, and they go, hold on could we do it like this um, and it, yeah I, it's super exciting to see what, what people are actually going to come up with as the quality gets better and you know we were talking to someone yesterday about the little resin guys yes the um, SLA the stereo photography SLA yeah SLA printers um, and it the quality is amazing you're getting these huge beautiful textures that are, are completely seamless without any of the styration lines it's such a gorgeous thing yeah, yeah. You know, and those resin printers are not a lot like three, four hundred quid for some of the small ones. Yeah, but totally affordable, really. If you're serious about getting into it, you'll spend that much on you know silicon to make yeah, them up. You know what I mean? So. But if you, if you think about that from a, a, a kind of a production point of view, you could you know scan a life cast, um, do a digital sculpt on it or a practical sculpt, rescan that. You can have your mold made in a shop somewhere, and while you're on set in Dubai or somewhere like that, you can just get a phone line up. Um, you know, beam the, get the file, file beam from wherever you are, and you print that mold. Mm. You can print that mold ready with injection ports and bleed holes and all of the stuff that we faff about. And duplicates with. of them. Yeah. So if you want to run five sets and you haven't got the time, just print three molds. You print, know, and print three molds. And you just know, bam, 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 bam. Yeah. It, that's really exciting. Yeah. I. Uh, it, and again, the crossover with with digital. I, I, I think that every element of our pipeline now can be lifted and done digitally and you know i love the fact that everything can switch around yeah yeah uh, you know to save time or to 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 make a better product um i, I think that's super exciting oh. um dave lopez from uh, legacy okay a couple of years ago and they were they're, they're kind of you know really far along this line of 3d printing they they print most of their stuff now uh, yes i heard uh, as i did um uh just a day on a it was a the he-man and skeletal um money supermarket commercial okay. i don't know if you saw that and they, they, they had the He-Man and Skeletor suits. Yep, I and, saw it. Uh, it was super fun. And, uh, yeah, they, they had... He told me that they sculpted it all in ZBrush and they printed stuff. Oh, wow, so that was, that was, they were all printed. And I assume they machined it and then they probably, you know, retextured it in plastic and then moulded it. But I've, it was, I've it, seen a few people you know, doing, you know, yeah, big foam carbs with a CNC yeah. and then coming in and just finessing the details, which... But it's happening, you know, again, it's a real thing. just having all that blocked out for you and having to just come in and finesse yes. saves you hours of time. And you know it's going to be right. You know it's going to fit the actor. You're not going to have, you know, problems with mold warping and, 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 you know, those little human errors that happen. Mm-hmm. If it's machined and done, everything's neat and accurate. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's, it, it, you know, things like that. I, I didn't realise they were... Um, they were 3D printed. Yeah. But have you, have you seen the, the, the guy who does the Trump uh, mask? Yes. Um, they're all 3D printed. Yeah, incredible. Incredible. And when you get up to those, you can actually see the, the striations. But because he's running them in silicon and the translucency of it, right. they just fade away to the eye. You know, things like that, we can get away with so much with rubber. No, but that, that'll get better over time. Yeah. You know, that fidelity, the print will just become standard. Even, even the 300, you know, oh, not even 300, 170 quid under threes yeah. that we're running. Yeah. The... You know, we, we're printing tiny little things and getting so much detail in them. Yeah. You know, when we're printing big stuff, it's hardly noticeable at all. Wow. It's just a matter of time. But what's interesting is the software remains the same. Like, you use Fusion 360 or you might use, you know, ZBrush or something to sculpt something. And the limitation really is just the quality of the printer you can afford. Or if you're going to go shape yeah. or something, get something printed. But, you know, it's like if you could get a 20000 or or $100,000 printer you could take that same file and get it printed it'll come out better so the limitation isn't yours personally anymore 
you know what I mean? You can make these things digitally that are beautiful, and you just wait for the technology to catch, to up. catch up. Well, I, you know, I'm, I'm still not great with ZBrush, so that's yeah. definitely that's definitely the choke point in my process. Yeah, yeah. Um, and to uh, speak to Richard about that, <laughs> yeah. he, he, was, he always promises he'll oh, we'll come up and do it. I should take him up on that because yeah, we need to do a uh, a day where we uh, just like an oh, amnesty. Oh. We all come here and like cry and just get it over with. Just I'm, I'm actually much better at ZBrush when I have someone stood over my shoulder who knows how to work the throat. <laughs> yeah. Well, you get stuck on those little stumbling blocks, don't you? Yeah. That suddenly you get down a rabbit hole of trying to figure it out and I don't even know how to word the question to Google it yeah. and you just get lost in stuff sometimes. I think ZBrush is, is particularly unintuitive to start off with as well and you know as you're learning that program it's, it's a really it's not like picking up a stick and pushing it into play. Mm. You know you get an immediate tactile response you know what sort of mark you're making because you, you can look at it and change the pressure on your hand. Mm. You know I think there are you need to have some understanding of, of digital process to work something like ZBrush. You know, yeah. when you're subdividing your layers and, and, and you know getting all your uh, geometry smashed into one another, that's when things get super complicated with that show. Yeah, yeah, it's incredible. And those those are like technical things that you do get used to, but I don't think that you would necessarily become somebody that does just one or the other. I think you do both. You yeah, know, you might still like clay at times, and I don't think that using ZBrush would make you a lesser sculptor. I think you become better because you're still dealing with form it's and the shape. S- it's the same thing for me. It's just you know, it's like if someone brings out a different clay. When uh, when Monster Clay came out, you know, four or five years ago, it was everyone jumped on it. It was like, hey, it's a new. It's just a new medium to play with. Yeah, and and I think you know, you see a lot of people producing incredible sculptures digitally and you know they still have to be good sculptors mm. it's just that it's a slightly different medium you still need to understand form and light and you know uh, anatomy and, and, and uh, you know uh, biomechanics to, to create a good creature whether that's practically or digitally yeah um, yeah the, but it, the, the, the exciting thing is that tool gives you so many options moving forward yeah. you know you can you know you, you, like you said you can you know you could print something that's you know a little bit uh, uh, almost like a a core yeah uh, like you know you could build a uh, print like an armature, armature. yeah um, so you've got some detail on that but all your forms there and then you go in and you finesse it or you know you can print the thing directly um, pour up a, a, a quick mould of it run some clay in and then go in and finesse that you know yeah. you've got so many options there oh my god um, that's quite exciting the thought you could like yeah no do like a sculpt it beautifully how you want it to look the rough shape then reduce it Print that as an armature and then lay on the five or six mil of plate yeah, and then really. really well, that, that's the sort of that's we, we've, uh, one of our students has been playing with with exactly that um, and kind of you know we've been messing around with like leaving little dimples so you know exactly how thick your clay is going in places. Oh, so yeah. you are only getting that couple of mil thickness. Um, yeah, there's there's some really really cool things. I love the idea of you know just running a you know a really quick quick dirty mold or something, pouring some clay in and then getting in and you know really working those fine pores and yeah, you know, yeah. there's so many you know cool approaches to the this technology yeah I think that's the thing is it's finding a, a, how to make it work for you and find different ways of using it because there's a there's a little bit of a push upwards I think where like there's a technology here and it's kind of beckoning people to come up to it but I think it's everyone needs to learn how to use it so they can take that shit and then run in their different directions and we can like you say I think in a few years we're going to see some really exciting things happening because people are just going to break the rules well it, it, that, know, and that, you know. that that's when things get exciting when when people go okay i'm familiar with this now i know how it works i know the, the basics of it mm-hmm. um you know how you know how far can i push this mm-hmm. it's like i was chatting with neil about kind of you know mixing mixing deadener ratios and he spoke to the manufacturer and they were like oh yeah we we, we can mix up to like you know three or four percent sometimes and neil's like i am going up to about 200 you know, it, it, it's really our industry that just pushes that envelope, and, and that's the exciting thing to see see yeah. how someone's going to break something to yeah. make something better. And um, one of the reasons why we're, we're we're going through a massive kind of rewrite in the course at the minute, and one of the things we're going to start pushing a lot more of is, you know, that you know the CNC, the 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 three D modeling, um, and you know we're going to be working a little bit in CAD, but also in ZBrush, just to kind of see where where the where the balance is and what you know what where where the that kind of tipping point of, of kind of into kind of ingenuity mm. uh, people end up that was a terrible sentence I really kind of tell no, that no but I know what you mean but it's just it's getting um, it's making people sort of fluent in something so they can just use it yeah um, as, like, like everyone knows how to type now and everyone has a screen mm. I when I was at college uh, when I was at school sorry I remember having Pittman typing lessons we had typewriters um, and it was like a class and I remember thinking at the time you know I don't want to be working in an office this is something I need to know and had I got good at it and I could have touch typed you know the, the speed with which I could use my computer would have increased you know um, and it's just like things change and you don't know how it's going to go and um, and I think you're right it's like 
it's it's something you've got to I think get involved in if you're interested in it and not be afraid of because it's a it's not as expensive as it was and b it's getting more and more accessible and that then becomes part of the canon I mean one of the things I think would be interesting is like there are a lot of departments I have a, a contention that there is still a bit of a divide between the digital world and the practical world and I think I would argue it's probably easier for people who do things practically to start learning this digital stuff than the other way around like for example if you're going to do hair for something um, it would help if you knew how to style a Marcel wave if you're going to animate it and I know that there is a lot of work I mean you see like those Pixar documentaries where they're doing animal stuff and so they'll go spend some time at a zoo and they'll video elephants walking and they're already getting the skin of how it works which is the kind of thing you would do practically um, but I think the people should get familiar with it enough so they stop being thinking it's somebody else's job to do that and I would love to see a day where you know hairstylists are the ones using software to design the hair or something do you know what I mean so it's not a dividing I think that has yeah, to be the below way. And below, under, above and below a line kind of thing. Yeah, it's, it's a line it, that we don't have to it's have. It's got to go that way. And I, I, I do think that the, kind of, you know, the, the practical and digital teams are, are now speaking a lot more. Mm. There's a lot more communication. But the, like you said, you know, the, 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 the gap there is the, the communication language. Mm. So if, if as a practical effects kind of um, community we start to embrace this digital process a little bit more, we start doing a little bit more... 3D printing starts a little bit model, more modeling. Our language starts to become the same. We start using the same um, uh, techniques and processes, and that communication is going to get better. Mm-hmm. And I think then we'll start to see a lot more kind of back and forward. Like I was saying before, most shops I know now are, are investing in some form of, of digital sort of production or, or manufacture. So you know, 3D printing or CNC, because um, the, it's got to be where the future is. It, it it's it's. The option to save time and, and money and, you know, the, the comment I made before about, you know, before the mould, the, before the sculpture's finished, someone kind of, you know, done a quick, it, you know, for, for a, a, you know, a, a jacket, it doesn't need to be super accurate. It doesn't need to fit. It just needs to be enough. A in, bit bigger in, everywhere. Yeah, so you get a layer yeah, of rubber. Yeah, yeah. So that can, be, that can happen whilst before the sculpture's finished. Someone could go away and make that mould. By the time you're finished, you know, your very final kind of pore flourish, you've been picking away and you go, right. And someone just goes clunk, bolts it together. Amazing. And so we've been we've been messing around with putting magnets in uh, like little neod- neod- neodymium. So when you pop in a mold like that together, it's just clunk, and it'll key itself and register. And then obviously a couple of bolts to keep it safe. But you're not having to bolt the whole thing all the way around. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, there, there's so many cool things that can be done. It's just it's going to take um, a bunch of people who are super excited and probably smarter than you or I and you know and at some point it, it will become a, a standard yeah um, but yeah it, it, it's super exciting at the minute it is I think as well that the um, if you do do things practically you know what corners you cut what it's saving you and like you're saying like you do something you go oh I've used magnets before so I'll make a little socket to accommodate a magnet you know when we do it so the print comes out with a whole app and you just drop it in with a bit of epoxy glue and it's like oh you know, it's amazing. You just and the, enhancing it. The, the, one of the great satisfying things about I'm, I'm a super tactile person. I like to hold and, and make things. When you get that fresh off the print bed and you've got your you know your, your three mil magnet and you just go and it just push fits in and you're like oh that was nice. and then you get the other side of it and it goes Shunk, and just and you're like this is pretty good. Yeah. You know it's it's super satisfying. I I, I was always kind of. I love the digital side of things. I, you know, I think some of the, the digital artists working at the minute do incredible things. And I've always been, um, you know, I always felt that I could kind of, as I was training, I would have lent that way. But I don't have the thing at the end of it. The, the actual, you know, I need a, a, you know, I'm very childlike. I need the, the, the thing at the end. I need to be able to hold it or, you know, and interact with it physically. The digital, you know, the 3D printing digital manufacturer is allowing us to do that now. So you know, we've talked a little bit about mold making. I think one of the interesting things that we, I'm seeing in my students at the minute, uh, we've had these printers since sort of uh, just before Christmas, so they are really getting on board with it, um, is, you know, designing and building, you know, bits for, for your, your actual creatures or your sculptures. So, you know, we've had a, a few of them who have done these really elaborate uh, demon horns that, again, magnet. So you build your keys already in, and, you know, it, it's super cool because you're building your keys in and sculpting around that, and that comes part of the mold, but then it all just pops together. And the, the weight of the 3D printing as well, you know, you you know, you can you can strip out all the weight, and they are they're actual products in themselves. It's not something that you need to go away and mold and, and finish. Yeah. 
Awesome stuff. Yeah, you do one horn how you like, then flip it, and you don't get oh. the TM, that kind of thing. Mirror tool in real life, man. <laughs> I, you know, I, if someone would have would have told me years ago, I would have just started working on my left hand. Yeah. You know, I, I, I'm, he's, he's almost as good as the right. That's not true. He's shit. He's, you know, but that's my mirror tool. My right. left hand is my mirror tool. Right. You know, just you know, in ZBrush, the ability to press X and get everything copied over. That's quite um, amazing. Obviously, you've got to go in and asymmetry it up a little bit afterwards. But yeah, yeah, yeah mirror tool. I'd kill for a real life mirror tool. It'd be fantastic, wouldn't it? <laughs> amazing, Richard. Thank you so much. I keep calling you Richard. It's Rick. It's Rick. Uh, Rich is fine. My yeah. my mum will be really that's happy with that. Well, it just sounds like you're like the kind of name you get called when you're being told off. That's what I'm going to be. I do on. feel like I'm in trouble. Okay, Rick, that was awesome. Thank no, you so thanks much. Thanks very for your much, time. man. It's been a pleasure. Cheers. Okay. I think 3D printing is is going to do for for the world what personal computers did mm. back in the back in the early 80s it's and I think we have yet to even imagine how they're going to change everyday life yeah well it's like you say it becomes a, a generation comes into it with it in, into a world where it's already a thing, and so you know their their, their expectations and, and and version of the world has incorporated that. So they don't think of a of a way of not using it. So it just kind of becomes natural to more people, and it will just kind of swap in there. Well, I, I'm having so much fun with this, <laughs> and it doesn't do everything, but what it does do really well tends to be the things that are quite tedious or difficult or virtually impossible to do by hand like making precision yeah. exact things to interlock and all that kind of stuff without having to make molds and negatives necessarily to begin with you can just dry run it all you know in something like fusion you know and actually and it's only going to get better as we're going to as the materials that they're developing to work with our existing filament printers becomes much stronger and uh, adapted for for all kinds of uses where we can put it in an oven and, and do foam latex in it because it's not going to melt the plastic mm. um, or it's going to be going to be really strong because it's it's got metal fibers in it or whatever the case may be you know I, I just know it's they've already developed new materials since I wrote the chapter on 3D printing for for my book mm-hmm. That you know, the next edition is going to have to have so many revisions because 3D printing will have changed so dramatically from what is in the book now. Yeah, yeah, much progress. But it's that thing of of, of using it in a relevant way for you, isn't it? That's the most important thing. Because I think right. you can. A lot of people can be very distracted by oh, it's changing, it's changing. It's like yeah, it is, but you also have to sort of stop and smell the roses and actually, you know, use it. Like you say, I mean, like the prints, you know, you buy, it's old fashioned the minute you get it home, but that doesn't matter. It still does great things. I was looking at it today, like the quality yeah. of the print is like, holy shit, it's amazing. And it's doing, okay, it's going to take 12 hours to print, but it's doing it while I'm doing other stuff. You know, it's brilliant. So yeah. um, it's just a, a way of, being able to output stuff that you do digitally, I think that's the thing. It, it gives well, the perfect really example is is with uh, the collapsible hand cores that I printed. Mm-hmm. That if you were gonna if you were gonna create those the way Brian Best showed me how to do it, mm-hmm. where you have to wall it up, and it's it's a much more complicated process than printing these individual pieces that are already going to fit together. Yeah. And if you need to mold, make molds of the individual pieces so you can have, you know, do, do the cores out of a stronger, more resilient material that you can do foam latex with. Mm. Cause if I were to put the, you know, my, my master printed cores in, in my foam oven, they would just become a, a nice gloopy pile <laughs> of plastic. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but what I like about the 3D printing but thing, I can print I can print and print it and do something else while it's printing instead of yeah. having my entire day devoted to um, making each segment of of the hand in the mold yeah now it's this stuff like this is you know what I'm doing now like this core 
you know, it's all going to be very neat and precise. The, the sides are perfectly straight and, and exactly 90 degrees. Or if I wanted them radius, they'd all be the same radius. And then I could make a mold wall that was the exact radius to fit that, you know, and yeah. all those kinds of things. Those are the kinds of things which, you know, material variation and stuff or great skill are needed to avoid. But that simplifies that process. That's stuff that I don't necessarily want to be better at i'd rather i'd rather the machine took care of that so i can spend more time doing the fun stuff um but it's 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 something where i guess people had to be good at everything or these things that we're doing digitally because there wasn't an option so now that there is it's like you know it's great to be able to run 25 miles but it's also nice to have the option to drive because cars exist you know so and you could still go running you don't have yeah. to not not be able to do that just because you own a car but uh, there are certainly times where it's nice to be able to drive somewhere so um so i think it's a case of yeah using the things to your advantage rather than you know how can you how can you use it as rick said in the interview you know how can you break this and use it bend it to your will you know things come out of the box designed for one thing but you find a way of you know of, of, of using sure, it, it's like Home, De- Home Depot doesn't doesn't naturally sell make and sell stuff that we use because I, I'll go to Home Depot because I need certain things to create something and they say, "What are you making?" Oh, that question. <laughs> and I tell and, they, and I tell them, and they look at me like I've got lobsters coming out of my ears. <laughs> You should do that as a makeup. That'd be cool. Most of the stuff I buy at Home Depot <laughs> or a little hat is uh, not going to be used for its original intended purpose. Yeah. No, I get the cold and sweats that, when that and, question comes up. Yeah. Yeah, and that's that's what's cool. Is it comes back around to, you know, there's a half dozen ways to do everything that we do and you just got to explain like like with whether you do you use Forton or or uh, something else. Mm. Yeah. Just Experiment. Go out and get an idea and try something new. Mm. And if it works, cool. If it doesn't work, also cool because you've learned that that's not an avenue to pursue anymore. And you cross that off the list and you try something new. Yeah. Yeah. It will be good to do some direct comparisons. Then you could look at, you know, uh, material, you know, cost, material, weight, and then, you know, a list of sort of pros and cons as to why one one over the other because i guess it is quite confusing when you come into this there's all these different options and you can get a little bit sidetracked thinking oh i got to use the right thing but there isn't a right thing it's, it depends on the job which is yeah um, and i think i think safety concerns for uh budgetary and safety concerns are really important for students to to look into and going to try to help find find something that you can use in your kitchen that won't render your kitchen un- <laughs> unusable for its original yeah, purpose. That's, that's not good to do. <laughs> All right, mate. Thank you very much, sir. Thanks, you too. Later. All right, mate. Have a good evening. Take care. Bye. Thanks, man. Good to speak to you. Bye. Bye.